Okay, cool. All right, so amazing quote. But what he's trying to say here, and again, interpret it how you want to. But what I really like about this is the crux of it is ask the right questions and the solution to your problem will be that much easier. All right now, as traders, I think the mistake we make is we keep asking a different question every single day. All right now, when we keep asking that different question, we can't actually collect and remember all the answers. So it doesn't form any kind of pattern in our brain. Um, and the, the example I like to use, imagine, you know, someone said to me um, yesterday about time and we were talking about the concept of time. And I said to them, imagine if you go and every single day you write out what you've done in a day. So you allocate three categories, work, leisure, and whatever, sport, okay? And you allocate a time. You physically write down, I spend this amount of time, this amount of time, this amount of time. And you keep a log for one month. Now, most people seem to think there's very little time, or they have little time, or they don't have time to do the important things. That's always the standard excuse, okay? But we never ever objectively go and look at it and say, well, let me actually look at the facts, which is how much time does exist, because we never write it down. But by asking that right question, how much time for leisure, how much time for work, how much time for sports, we can then go and look at the facts. And the facts are, well, actually, we probably spend about 50 hours, 60 hours a month of leisure, watching TV, relaxing. Okay, so the next time someone asks you effectively, ultimately, how much time you have, and you come with that stock standard answer, I don't have much time, I don't have time, just think about the answer. Think about, really, do you have time? Okay, and that's the crux of it, is that Albert was trying to tell us, ask those right questions, and the solution's going to come that much easier. And that's why I really like that quote. Bearing in mind, he said this back in the 1800s, 1900s. Um, so if it was true back then, it's true today. Okay, what we're we going to talk about, we're going to go through the interaction principles now. We're going to start to hit home on them a little bit harder, a little bit more strategy specific. Um, we're then going to talk about trade execution management. So how we trade. Where are we putting our stops? How are we looking for targets? What are we trying to do ultimately? Um, we're then going to play the scenario analysis, which is kind of fun. Okay? A bit like what I did to you there. What do you think? What do you think happened based on the facts? And then I'm going to take you through the templating process. Now, the reason we do it this way around is that after this session, um, we're then going to go to the strategy session. I'm going to show you two strategies that have been back tested, they've been trialed, they've been everything. Okay? It's been done by me. And I'm going to show you how those strategies work. Now, for some of you, it might be something you like. For some of you, it might not. The important thing is do not go away with those strategies thinking you're going to make a million bucks on Monday. Because guess what? I won't even make a million bucks on Monday, as much as I wish I would. All right? The important thing is to know there's, a, there's an approach. I want you to see the process I'm going to explain to you. I want you to take away how in-depth my interpretation is of that strategy. Compare it to how you interpret it. Okay? Compare it to the approach you take so that you can maybe recognize the shortcomings in your approach. Maybe you can recognize, well, actually, I need to be a lot more specific on certain things. And that's why I want to share the strategies with you so you can see how in-depth, how specific it is. Okay, let's get into it. Um, by the way, after this, we can have some lunch um, and it'll be nice. So what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about information versus opportunity. Okay? It's called the information spectrum. Right, I want to drive home that, that concept of the price of information a little bit further. We're going to talk about flow-driven versus technical markets. Okay? We're going to talk about volatility. We're going to talk about absorption and consolidation. Again, bad highs, bad lows, market positioning, support and resistance, and auction imbalances. Now, by the way, if you ever see any spelling mistakes or anything that doesn't quite look right, bear in mind this was done... Um, with a dash of speed as well. Okay, it's a lot of slides, so do accept that grammar is, uh, you don't need to be able to spell to make money in the markets, fortunately. Okay, so this is information versus opportunity. It's a very simple curve, and, and it's, it's, a, it's one of those simple, simple concepts, but extremely powerful. All right, information is what we act upon. Uh, we look at the charts, whatever the charts are, and we have various information coming to us. Now, we have to act upon that information, okay? But what we don't always sort of conceptualize is how much opportunity, thanks, is there relative to the information? And then which point am I in that information spectrum? 
So what do I mean? Okay. Let's say we're using a traditional candlestick. And we have this breakout. We see it's a significant area, maybe a daily low or whatever. We can see the volume's picked up. Okay, so there's some, some sell side pressure coming and we've seen price respond. Okay, so that's price and that's the volume picking up. Maybe the volatility's picked up. Now there's information in the market and that information has got to do with the fact that there's selling pressure coming into the market. Okay, we can see that selling pressure with the price and the volume picking up. Now, as we get more information, if I was to put this into a time frame and call each one of these a number, so number one, two, three, four, as price moves more and more information comes to the market, and it doesn't matter what that information is, but as that information comes to the market, the potential for opportunity becomes less and less and less. Okay, now sometimes warranted those opportunities can be quite big i.e. the Central Bank of uh, Europe comes out on this previous Thursday and says, by the way, we're not going to stop quantitative easing. Okay? In which case, the information versus opportunity is a very different looking curve. Okay? It's probably going to look a little bit something like that. Why? Because the market has to aggressively reprice itself. Okay? So this curve is going to look very different based on the different types of strategies. Take. The important takeaway from this is as more and more information comes in, your potential for opportunity becomes less and less, right? And this is why I like the footprint chart because what I'm going to show you as we go through now the second and third uh, sessions is that you're going to start to see that the footprint allows you access to information at a relatively early stage. Okay, relatively early, what I mean is we come in in the morning and someone sends me a, a Skype saying, what do you think of the sentiment? And I say, wow. Chinese, China's data is pretty shocking, actually. Europe's going to have a headache today. Structure looks weak. How much information do I have? Relatively little. Okay, there's, a bit of, there's an element of thumb suck in that entire process. Why? Because there's no objective fact that states that price is going to go down. Okay, it's just news. It's sentiment. It, it's a subjective thought. So we're somewhere over here on the, the information spectrum. Why? Because if I take the punt now, and I put on a trade, i.e. short, and I play for sentiment to go negative. All right? If I get it right, I'm going to get the maximum amount of opportunity. And rightfully so. Okay? I have no available information. I'm taking on more risk. Right? Therefore, I deserve the most opportunity. Now, why I like the footprint is that the footprint kind of marriages it. It comes into a nice middle ground where the moment the information starts to come to the market, the footprint gives you that early information signal. It gives you that early sort of heads up that something is changing, something's different. Now I'm going to come back to the example of China. Let's say 8 a.m. Right, that's the time the DAX and the stocks open up. 8 a.m. suddenly on the open, on the cash open, we start to see initiative coming in. Now this is one of the strategies we're going to talk about. Okay, so we see this initiative coming in and it's aggressive. It's candle after candle. One time framing, high volume, very big selling. Okay? We see very big liquidity being provided, but equally the sellers take all of that liquidity and keep forcing prices lower. Suddenly what's happening is I've got early information that price is going to potentially go lower. Okay? I'm marrying the concept of the subjective view which I get from maybe my fundamentals, maybe my newspapers, maybe my market profile, maybe my candlestick. So I get the subjective, subjective idea, which is I think price is going to move lower because of structure, because of the technicals. But the moment that footprint comes in, it starts to give us that confirmation. It tells us that our synopsis is potentially accurate. Now remember, as that footprint is painting the picture and we're seeing more and more liquidity provided by the buyers but more and more is being hit, we're seeing more and more volume coming in but price keeps going lower, we're steadily starting to move down the information spectrum. So there's that way up between how much information the market provides versus how much potential opportunity is left. Again, important to factor this into your strategies. That is why I get very annoyed when people say, oh, but why didn't you take 60 ticks? It's not about taking 60 ticks. It's about how much information is in the market, how many prices can I extract from that market based on that information, and how can I reduce my risk? Okay.
Now we're going to go through this quite a lot substantially. Everything I'm going to show you now in the next couple of slides is all about information. It's all about at what point we are in that information spectrum, how you can use that information and take advantage of the opportunity. Okay. So flow-driven technical markets. Now we were talking quite a lot in this break about volatility. Okay. And again, the crux and the takeaway of it, don't shy away from volatility. Why? Because one of the principal truths you said, volatility, it invites, it forces people to respond. Okay, when people are forced to respond, that creates opportunity for us. So we don't shy away from opportunity, we take advantage of opportunity. Okay, now how do we take advantage of opportunity? Well, the first thing we have to recognize is the manner in which we execute in a non-volatile market is different to the manner in which we execute in a volatile market. If you are trading the same approach in a volatile versus non-volatile, you are not accepting the condition change. It's the same with flow-driven and technical markets. Okay? Now the best way to explain this is to tell you, when we are in technical markets, I will be a pro liquidity provider. Okay? I'll happily provide limits and put limits into the market and fade a market or, or look for potential support resistance. Right? When we're in flow-driven markets, I have no interest in being a liquidity provider. I prefer to be taking liquidity from the market. Exact same synopsis, exact same, exact same way of looking at the markets, the process changes. Okay, and the process has to change because the risk has changed. Okay, so flow-driven markets are nothing more than where there's flow in a market. Okay, there's maybe negative sentiment, the flows come in. It's month end, the flows come in. It's the end of the year, the flows come in. Okay, you've all heard of the Christmas rally. Right? The reason it happens is simply because of the tax incentives involved in squaring up positions. Right? So what typically used to happen, if you go and look at this on a chart, we used to get year-end rallies in to the end of the year. Why? Because we obviously used to get that, rather than take the profits, let's invest it into the market and postpone or defer the tax. Likewise, at the start of the year, you used to get the sell-off. Why? Because you used to get the unwind of those positions. Now, if you come in and you're not aware of a flow-driven dynamic and you go, well, you know what, I've got this resistance level and I'm going to sell it to you. I'm going to provide liquidity in a flow-driven market. What's going to happen? Do you think the big institutions are going to stop buying it just because you're providing liquidity? No. Okay. So we adjust in flow-driven markets. We acknowledge that the flows are there. They're driven by bigger time frame participants and we adjust. So it's not to say we don't sell. We do sell. Okay? If we feel there's a good enough trade opportunity and we feel that we have an edge there, we sell, we just don't provide the liquidity, we let someone else provide it, and then we partake. We take liquidity as well. Is that market orders? Okay. So flow is just where market participants are not passive, they're more initiating. So they don't want to wait for market price, they want to take market price. Okay? So it's a little bit like when we spoke about initiative versus responsive. In flow driven markets you'll have a lot more initiative. Okay, so think in terms of lots of participants want to be buyers of the market, they're more aggressive, you know, prices tend to move around a little bit further, there's less technical ability of the market, so the market's not respecting technicals as much. Is that more market orders then? Uh, again, not necessarily. You, not necessarily. Okay. You also mentioned that the participants are less price sensitive. Okay, 100%, good spot, spot on. Less, what, less price sensitive. Yeah. Okay, so in flow driven markets, Goldman Sachs doesn't care if you've got a resistance level there. They have to fill the order. Mm. If they've got to fill the order, they're going to take whatever they need to take to get the order filled. So yes, yeah, Boron, good point. Okay. Um, where's technical markets? Exactly what it says. The markets are respecting the technicals. Now, a good way to look at technicals is a little bit like the oil. And I've had a painstaking time with oil of late, simply because it's actually driving me mad. Um, but in essence, what's happening in oil, if you were to go get an oil chart up since the beginning, since the end of October, beginning of November, right, it's starting to look a little bit something like this. Right, where we've got, some people will call this support, some people will call this resistance. I think it's the other way around. Okay, I think it's the inability to be aggressive there and the inability to be aggressive there. Okay, how do I know that? Well, if you go look at the footprint, every time we get to these regions, what ends up happening is everyone backs out of the short very quickly. In other words, no one wants to be aggressively short there. No one wants to be aggressively long there. 
And we can see it with the response. When it gets down to these points, everything just V reverses. Okay, the marker just turns on its dime and suddenly reverses very aggressively in the opposite direction. Yeah, and there'd be multiple opportunities to uh, Okay, so what are we in now? Are we in a technical market or are we in a flow-driven market? Okay, at the moment it's very much a technically driven market. If you just look to be a buyer at these levels and look to be a seller at these levels, right, why not because I say so, but because you can see every time we're getting to that point, the sellers are reluctant to the lows and the buyers are reluctant to the highs. We acknowledge that's the technical landscape. We allow someone else to come in and provide the liquidity on the lows and we partake to the upside. Now ironically enough, I've been doing precisely the opposite for three, four weeks. And you can only imagine what's happened as a result. Right? So it's not to say I don't have a bias, it's not to say I don't have a view, it's not to say I don't make the mistakes. The important takeaway from that is, the lesson from it is that there are factual observations, facts, undeniable facts that we can take from that oil. I've just chosen to trade as a trader to not execute based on those facts. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm being presumptuous in hoping that that's going to change, that maybe someone's actually going to start selling it there and taking the initiative or maybe someone's going to start buying it there. I'm going against the technical landscape of the market. Now that can change. Okay? We could find oil takes out 49.50 which is now our yearly low since whatever, 2016, 2017. And we could find the flows come in. Anyone long just panics and the market capitulates again, like we did from 78 down to 49 and a half. We could go another $10. The flows could come in. If you stand there and start to provide liquidity in a flow-driven market, right, you know what's going to happen. If you stand there, you acknowledge the flow-driven market, you allow someone else to provide liquidity, then you partake, the odds are in your favor. Okay. And that's what the footprint is. It's about getting those odds in your favor. Playing the game in your favor. Remember what I said to you right in the beginning. Every game has a set of principles, a set of rules. You have to know how to bend those rules, bend yourself within those rules. It's not to say we don't buy it. Heck, if oil drops $3 a Monday below $49, i am going to be looking for a buy. It's gone way too far. Of course I'm going to look for a buy. At some point someone's going to buy it. But I ain't going to be the first jack to buy it. Let someone else stand in the way, provide liquidity, and give it a crack. Bend the rules in your favor. The rules do not say you cannot buy. The rules say that when there's flow, there's going to be a lot of panic. Know those rules, bend yourself in those rules, and partake in those rules. Would you say flow is more fundamental? Uh, yes, it, flow would generally be more fundamental based. But it's generally, I think, if you were to summarize it one thing, it, it's price directional. So there is natural price direction, but it's also, it, it doesn't respect the technicals. Okay, there's no respect for any kind of technicals because it's not being driven by anything other than big time frame players are coming and they need to execute orders. Okay, everyone happy with that? Brian, yes. you just uh, admitted that you've been misplaying this market. Yes. And it's, you didn't enlarge on, on that. It's quite an interesting point. Yep. So how did you expose your, uh, from journaling, are you going to enlarge on uh, how you picked yourself up? Okay. Um, <laughs> the simple answer is I've been journaling it and I've been aware of what it's doing. Okay. But I haven't been willing. To admit it. <laughs> it's a difficult one to say because I think finally, I mean, to call it what it is, I've actually been looking more on the long side of the trade. Um, and then this week I decided, no, actually, it's looking very technically weak now, so I want to go short. So, and now I'm stuck and I'm, I don't, psychologically, I, I don't want to trade it. I feel like it doesn't matter what I do, I'm going to get punished either way. So, I've gone to that sort of, that state of mind now where I'm not looking at it, I'm not following a process, put it that way. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gambling in oil. That's, in essence, what I'm doing. I'm not sure of my own process in this world right now. So, how do I overcome it? I can back out of it and just give up and come back to oil next year at some point when structurally it makes more sense. But I'm not going to gain anything from that. Okay, and that's why as a trader what you have to learn to do is sometimes you're going to battle. Okay, I've not made a drop in the oil for three, four weeks now. I've only lost in the oil. Okay, and I don't enjoy losing. But every time I'm paying for information, okay, like I just said to you, I am 1000% guaranteed for sure 
that there are reluctant sellers and reluctant buyers at highs and lows. I know that for a fact. I can see it. Okay, and I can see it because I keep reinforcing it every time I'm losing, going, well, why are you selling if everyone's reluctant to sell it? So what do you think is going to happen the moment I see on that footprint that those sellers are no longer reluctant? There'll be a shift in structure. Okay, so what am I going to do instinctively? Sell it. Okay, how am I going to sell it? Actively, aggressively, hard. I'm going to make sure that I get paid for every single frustrating day I've taken in the last three weeks. You haven't really made a mistake. You were just observing and you've been paying. Okay. So you've nailed something in the head there. Right. Who plays poker? Okay. So we've got one poker player. Now, one of the biggest mistakes that poker players make, poker is not a game of cards. Everyone thinks it's about the cards. It isn't. It's about... It's about the telltale signs, it's about asking the right questions of your opponents. Okay, you can have rubbish cards and win, you can have good cards and lose. Right? So it's about making sure every question you ask of another player, you're asking it so that you can get a specific response. I bet high, how does he respond? I bet low, how does he respond? Okay? It's the same thing within the markets in a day. We have to keep extracting information from the markets. The only way we extract that information is by being physically active, by taking the losses, by losing money. But making sure when we lose money, we still go do that debrief. Why did I lose money? Who on earth is buying it here when I'm selling it? Why are, they, why are they so reluctant to be a seller? What is the nature of that selling? What does it look like? Because I can tell you the nature of that selling every time in the world, and I can get an oil, to, we'll get to that oil, I've got a chart of it somewhere, okay? The nature of that selling is the same every single damn time. So guess what? It's going to shift. 100% it's going to shift, which means when that selling shifts, or equally when that buying shifts, I'm going to be able to take advantage because I've been asking the same damn question about it for the last three weeks, losing little bits, little bits, little bits, always managing the risk. But I can guarantee you when the time comes, my job as a trader is to take advantage of the information I've already paid for. Okay? And that's something that I think a lot of younger traders back off from. They, they shy away from it. They're afraid. Oh, I just lost five times in a row. Let me go and, you know, just cry about it. How many ticks loss would you take in oil? I'm sorry? How many ticks tick loss would you take? Depends on the trade. Yeah. Okay, like we'll talk a little bit about footprint strategies later. Mm -hmm. It depends where I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at the end of the day, I'll keep losing this oil because I'm paying for information. When the information changes and the opportunity exists, I'll still take that opportunity, but hopefully make back everything and some. Okay, and that's the crux. It's a little lesson for all of you. <coughs> Don't be afraid. Don't shy away from it. Get stuck in. Okay, this isn't a job that's nice. It's not, not going to pay you because you work hard because you're a nice person. Okay, it doesn't work like that. It's going to pay you because you have the tenacity and the determination to keep coming back and take the pain every time. Right, go look at every greatest leader, every greatest success story. All of it has the same repeated story, which is, I struggled my ass off, I failed, I wasn't good enough, but I got back up, I came back for some more, and eventually I got to the top. Okay, what we got here? Nice little E-mini S&P dailies. I just want to kind of bring some sort of an observation. If you want to try and differentiate between flow and between technical markets, okay, one of the key characteristics you can look at is the nature of the shift in volatility, okay? So typically speaking, a flow-driven market, like someone said, bless you, is very similar to a trend day. It's where there's price direction, but there's also a response in terms of volume and flow. So typically speaking, when you get very high volumes coupled with very high ranges, those would typically be flow-driven days. Now, if you want to go learn a little bit more about this, go and get this up. Draw this basic synopsis of where we got relatively high volume. Note we call it relatively high because it's above the five-day moving average. Those are just simply five-day moving averages. At the top, we've got volume. At the bottom, we've got range. Okay, so we want to observe a relationship, which is when we have a high range and high volume, what does this day type look like? Let's go and zoom in. Let's see what it looks like to be a buyer on that day. Let's go and provide liquidity in this market and see what it looks like getting my ass handed to me. Okay. Now this is the mistake traders make. They'll go and they'll shy away from that. They'll say, well, it's volatile. Wow, that just did 80 handles. I ain't touching that. Right? There's a lot of potential opportunity within those flow days. But first you have to recognize what is a flow day 
and then go and take all the flow days, bring them all into one sort of subset, all those dates, and start to develop a footprint strategy on flow days. Do you see this carried on in 2019? The flow days? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hope so. Hope so. Okay. <coughs> So you can go through that process. You can see I've highlighted a number of potential flow days. Okay, recently, this is what's happened now. We've got a little bit more flow sentiment coming, a little bit negative sentiment, and we can see that high volume, high volatility response. Okay, whereas if we compare that, i.e. the low volume days, the average volume days, okay, we can start to also see the technical day types. So again, in certain day types, i.e. flow driven, we play flow-driven type strategy. In technical days, we play technical type strategy. Okay, and that's the key takeaway from it. And hopefully what it will do when we get to some of the examples, I will tell you, okay, we're going to do two strategies. One is a V-reversal, but very typically a V-reversal will be a flow-driven day type. Okay, V-reversals tend to come towards the end of a trend. It's when the market gets overly aggressive at some point. There's a high amount of volume and volatility, and we then get big time frame players on both sides. So big boys and big boys, but ultimately these big boys will end up winning the day. And that's one of the strategies we're going to discuss a little bit later on. Okay, so that's flow-driven and technical markets. Um, now volatility, I think I've actually covered quite nicely. Um, so I don't really want to talk too much about it. Um, what these blackboards are, it's an opportunity for me to illustrate. So if any of these concepts you're not 100% you know, sure about, remember these principles you have to know. They, they are like knowing the rules of a chess board, how chess pieces move. You have to know how they move, otherwise you don't understand the game. You can't build a chess strategy if you don't know how the pieces move. So volatility. We spoke and we said it's, in essence, a greater number of prices over which the markets facilitate trade. Okay, now, again, like I said, with flow-driven markets and technical markets, you have to adopt a different approach when there's volatility. Okay, now by approach, I don't necessarily mean adjust your clip. Okay, you don't go from a 10 lot to an 8 lot. Right, that's adjusting your risk, not adjusting your approach or your process. Okay, by adjusting your process, what I mean is, if you typically want to take liquidity from the market in a volatile market, okay, so i.e., we have this very key little area where we are looking for support. Market comes down, but the market is quite volatile. Right? By its very nature, if a market's volatile, there's not much liquidity being provided. In other words, in a non-volatile condition, it could come down and tick that price called 47 to the tick and rally. And you'll look at the charts then and they go, woohoo, I called the low. Okay, I got it at 47s. Whereas other days, it might go down to 30s and then rally, in which case we go, oh, I think I missed that one. I was right, I bought it, but I lost money. Again, can you see that? Can you see that deception, how we lie to ourselves? I lost money, but I was right. Okay, if I lost money, but I was right, are we going to bother to go and actually look at what happened? Come on, let's be honest, we're not going to. Why would we? I was right. Don't need to look at it. But when we look at it and we ask that question again of, why did it go through 47, stop at 30, and then go straight line? Technically, we were spot on. It is support. There was support. There. Clearly, there was support. But in the one instance, in the non-volatile condition, there's enough liquidity being provided. Okay, so when the market comes down there, there's enough liquidity that the sellers run into that liquidity, and they just stop, and the market can start to bid up. In the second example, where there's a very high volatility, there's not much liquidity being provided. So the market comes down in search of it, can't find it, goes through extends, eventually finds that pocket of liquidity, and then the sellers give up and it starts to go down. The difference is that if we don't go and observe what happens around this price point called support, this area, then we cannot begin to observe what or where the trade opportunities. More importantly, we won't know how to interact with the market at that opportunity. And again, this is where the footprint is unique because you will see that volatility. You will learn to see what absorption and liquidity looks like with the footprint. Just seeing it on a chart, all you're going to see, if you looked at a candlestick as well, it dropped below 47 to 30 and went all the way up. And then we give it this fancy word called head fake. Oh, it was a head fake. That it was a head fake. That's why I lost money, because it was a head fake. 
So, and then we'll go a little bit step further and we'll say, no, it was just the algorithm stopping out the longs and now they went bid. So again, we create this fallacy in our head of, it was the market's fault I was right, rather than why did it go through that support? How did it go through that support? What was the observations that I can take from that so that next time it happens, guess what? I ain't gonna be the sucker. I ain't gonna lose money just because there's this thing called volatility. I'm gonna let it go to that level. I'm gonna let it test and I'm gonna wait for that liquidity because the footprint has shown me time and time again when there's volatility, I wait, I let the liquidity come and then I partake. I do it that way around and I'm not a sitting duck. I'm not gonna get to the end of the day and go, yeah, I lost money because it was a head fake. I'm gonna get to the end of the day and say, I bought it at the right time because someone else started buying it. Okay, that's why volatility is important. Note the difference there. I don't adjust my clip, I simply adjust the approach. In approach one, I take liquidity. Sorry, in approach one, I provide liquidity. In approach two, I take liquidity. That's the adjustment in the process. Okay, so if you want to go look at volatility and observe it on a traditional chart, this is what it would look like. Okay, again, what we've got here is a five minute candlestick chart. And again, I've just put these little lines in. Now the reason I like to do this and, and sort of illustrate with candlesticks is so that you can begin to relate footprints with candlesticks. Because remember, it's not about one or the other, it's about the marriage of the two. Okay, so we can see the little bouts of volatility at the bottom here. Again, this is just five minute ranges. Now, the footprint and the markets in general is about looking for those relative shifts. That's why this big red line is there. All that is is showing what's more or less the average range that we're experiencing in this market over this entire session. And we can see that when we have these little spikes in range, i.e. the range expansion, the little bits of volatility, okay, we can obviously start to begin to highlight where those little bits of volatility are coming in. Now remember what I said to you, volatility doesn't imply trend, it just implies a greater number of prices over which trade is being facilitated. Okay, so that's, the, that's an example of what volatility will look like. Now, again, we can go a step further. We can say, well, where is volatility being experienced? Now, where is it coming from? What's the price location in which volatility is coming from? And again, we're asking the question. This is a question. We say to the where does the volatility come from? And straight away, you can see volatility starts where? It doesn't start at lower prices. It starts at higher prices and higher prices and higher prices and higher prices. Okay, more importantly, where's volatility predominantly coming from, the sellers or the buyers? Okay, we should all be able to say, yeah, there's a little bit of volatility from the buyers, but mostly it's coming on the sell side. Which way is price going? Okay, it's moving lower. What's happening when we get that volatility? Is there liquidity being provided? Yes, but not initially. Okay, so in this instance, suddenly we can start to say, okay, well, We've got a volatile market, I might want to be a buyer. And if I'm a buyer, do I want to be just randomly fading it? No, let the liquidity come in and the buy opportunities exist. The buy opportunities exist. The buy, the buy opportunities existed the entire day. Okay, so again, don't get too fixated. There's no strategy, there's nothing yet. It's about being aware of a conditioning called volatility and what it implies in terms of opportunity. Remember, most traders don't wake up first thing in the morning and look at their briefing sheet and it says, is there volatility? How many of you write that down on your sheet in the morning? Okay, does anyone write it down? Probably not. Do you think volatility impacts your trade strategy? I should hope so. Okay, so again, it comes back to Mr. Albert. Spend 55 minutes asking the right questions and five minutes solving them. Trading is not a game of, you know, solving problems. The problems take you a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds. You've got to spend the 55 minutes developing the approach to which you're going to solve the problem at the end of the day, not the other way around. And yeah, okay. Absorption consolidation. I'm going to go through this again. And I'm going to just start to drive home the concept of what we're looking for. Both will look very similar. We're going to call this distribution. The major difference, the significant difference between absorption and consolidation has to do with the volume traded. Okay. So, in essence, what happens in terms of price here? Is price is simply just navigating between two price points. 
Okay, it might come from the start of a trend. It might be that this is how the day started. But this is a type of price response. It's a way in which price is trading in essence. There's no real price pressure to the upside or to the downside. Now, the reason we have to differentiate between absorption and consolidation is simply got to do with the fact that high volume absorption will resolve itself. In other words, we have very high volume in the space between price 10 and price 18. Significant amounts of volume are coming in. Every time we come to the low, those sellers are hitting and they're hitting hard and they're hitting hard and hitting hard and the buyers just go response, response, response. And eventually the sellers give up and the buyers go initiate, initiate, initiate. Okay, we get to this top price point and the sellers go respond, 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 provide liquidity, give the liquidity. And the buyers give up and the sellers go initiate. Okay, so what are we seeing here? We're seeing effort. Who's the effort coming from? Buyers and sellers. Has to be. Okay, why? Because if the buyer is absorbing, providing all their liquidity, it means someone's giving them all that liquidity. So there's effort there, and there's effort there, and there's effort there, and there's effort. Now what happens when we get effort on both sides? Eventually, that energy, that built up frustration energy is going to resolve itself. That resolution will resolve in a continuation of prices. Now, I'm going to give you, I'm kind of leaning ahead here, but one of the tricks you learn with absorption is there's usually a very good telltale sign in, a, a telltale sign in absorption. Okay? The interaction at these lows is usually quite interesting. At the lows, you tend to see almost a very negative delta, okay? which shows you the absorption. Why? Because it shows you the sellers are selling into the bids, hitting it as hard as they can, and the buyers just reload, reload, reload. So the buyers are passive, the sellers are aggressive. And that gives us the continued negative delta. Okay, now a lot of people go, oh, there's negative delta here, and you know, it should be going down because there's all this selling, all this volume, all this negative delta. But they're not taking into account the price response. Remember, when we put a lot of effort in, we need price response. Otherwise, it's telling us someone else is on the other side. So, if we know that in an absorption that there's going to be a lot of effort at the low, what would you think would be the telltale sign that actually eventually this is going to resolve itself? One side's giving up. Okay, you're on the right track. So one side's going to give up. So what's the telltale sign then? Spot on. So finally, finally, all that buying, there might still be absorption here, but all that buying now is getting rewarded with a price shift. So very often, if you want to know when a market's now going to resolve itself, wait for what we call the conclusive close. Okay, and a conclusive close is just nothing more than a confirmed close. Confirm to me that all my effort is finally being rewarded with a price shift. In other words, when the market finally gives that if that's a five minute candle, let's draw it nicely. Five minute candle, nice full bodied, buyers finally get rewarded. Ding, 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 the signal's changed. Do you wait for that to close on the next one? So. Okay, wait for that to close and then you want to enter. So where does the stop go? <laughs> okay, I think you all say the same thing, but yeah. Below the effort, guys. So. At the end of the day, there's my confirmation. The market's just said to me, the game's changed. It's, we've dominated the sellers. We're finally getting our price short. So as a trader, I don't need to think, okay, well, it's a buy or a sell or the technicals say this. There's the technicals. We can all see it's in a sideways range. We can all see that the market's not going anywhere. The market's just signaled to me that the game's now changed. <laughs> I simply enter once I get that confirmation and I stop out where I'm wrong. Now tell me, as a trader, do you think if you followed this step-for-step -step process, do you think any of you would ever move your stop if you followed a process like this? Shouldn't. Okay, why shouldn't you? Okay, because you've solidified your process. If the, I'm horrible at baking, by the way, but I, I love baking. 
but I'm horrible because I don't use a measuring cup. I just kind of <laughs> throw stuff in a bowl, wicks it all up, and, and, and then the cream clots and all that kind of stuff. But anyways, the point I'm trying to make is that if you don't follow a rule-based process, you're going to make mistakes. When you follow a rules-based process, i.e., well, that's the consolidation close. It's told me that's the signal. I simply stop there because that invalidates this trade strategy called absorption continuation. There's no reason that you will ever move a stop because I just told you the stop goes there. Now, if I told you you apply that process to time and time again strategies, you should be winning more than 51% of the time. Suddenly, you've got a trade strategy. Now, a lot of you are going to go, but that it's too simple. It can't be that easy. But that's trading. It is as simple as ABC. Now, where most traders go wrong is in the interpretation. They start to see things that don't exist. They start to create something that doesn't exist. Simple strategy, simple approach, simple execution. That's absorption, high volume. Now consolidation, I like to always think of, uh, if I was to kind of summarize it, absorption tends to be bigger time frame players. Why? Because in order to transact that kind of volume at the lows and at the highs, you've got to have quite a bit of volume behind you. All right, so consolidation is almost the flip side of that. Consolidation tends to be more algorithmic in nature or, or lighter volumes. Now, the major reason why we distinguish between the two, okay, is because one on a footprint is going to look a little bit different. In other words, you're not going to get the aggressive negative deltas at the lows and the aggressive negative deltas at the highs. If anything, what you're going to get, you're not even going to get absorption, you're not even going to get dark colors, you're not even going to get liquidity. You're just going to get the market pinging off price points. Now, the reason we differentiate is because the likelihood once we break in either direction, the likelihood of continuation is not as high as in the example as absorption. Do you understand why we have to make that differentiation? Okay. If in consolidation we find that the probability of extension is 38%, but in absorption it's 58%, is it important for us to differentiate between absorption and consolidation? Is it important for us to be able to create a rules-based approach as to what is considered absorption, what is considered consolidation? Okay. And that's the approach we take, not just with a concept like absorption consolidation. It's with every single concept. Now remember what I said to you right in the beginning. When you start to tell the story of trading, okay, remember I didn't always know about footprints. I didn't tell myself these wonderful stories. But when I started to tell the story, I told the same story I've just told you now, which is when there's that high volume, that very aggressive intention, all right, and it starts to bounce, that's absorption. Now, someone might say to me, no, I don't agree. And I'd say, fine, I don't need you to agree with me. That's my story. And that's the story I observe day in, day out when I debrief. So long as I keep observing that story and I keep executing based on my story, that means my structured process will continue to remain consistent. Which means the outcomes won't always be profitable, but they'll be consistent outcomes. And so long as I'm winning more than I'm losing on it, okay, if it wins 10 ticks and I'm only losing two, and I get it wrong three times, but I get it right three times, I'm making money. Can you start to understand how we move away from this, this feeling of, I have to be right, I have to get this right, I have to make sure price goes up or down. It's not about which way price goes. What is price doing? What's the market doing? What can I observe with that market, what it's doing? How can I apply myself within that market? Now, there was a beautiful term I learned from one of the Axia traders. Um, fantastically engineer. The kind of guy you think always has a pencil in his ear. But he was very adamant on a concept called access in a market. And I'm going to share this with you because it's very, very important. So, I've just explained this example of absorption. So let's, we'll come back to completing consolidation in a minute. Let's say this is our absorption example, okay? And I've just said to you, for example, that 
We get above this high, the market effectively gets above it but closes all the way back down. Now instinctively what's very often going to happen as a trader is we're going to get all excited. We've just observed this pattern that we've been working hard on. It's going to break out of that high and we're probably going to want to preempt slightly. Okay, it's natural. The problem is that the market is just a bunch of information. Okay, information changes constantly, it draws all sorts of patterns and pictures. But what's always consistent in a market, and listen carefully, this is the truth, what is always consistent in a market, it will always point out various access points. What we mean by that? In this example, okay, if you went and drew out absorption and you went and found this in 10 markets over the space of the last year, and you went and you had the same rules-based fact approach, and you went and pulled out every single time there was, say, a full-bodied close above the absorption points, either the high or the low. And you go and observe what happens beyond that. Okay, what you are creating is, in effect, an access point. In other words, you're saying to the market, this is my conditioning. This is what allows me to access this concept called absorption continuation. Without this candle, do we have a trade? Anyone? Do we have a trade? What do we have? We always have a trade, but it's riskier. Okay. Without, without the confirmation. Okay, so in essence, we don't have a trade. This job's not about trading, guys. If the market gives you access to an opportunity, only if it gives you access to an opportunity, do you trade it? The wonderful example we always look at is breakouts. Okay, we all like breakouts, correct? Now, and this is something I had to spend a lot of time reflecting and thinking about because FOMO is very apparent in um, many traders, including myself. Okay, so let's look at a breakout and, and we'll finish this here. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm still sensitive about oil. Um, I don't. I don't remember. Okay. So let's look at this breakout. And I, I really want to drive home this access point uh, concept, guys, because it's incredibly vital. So we have this breakout, and I don't know if most of you have done the free. Uh, on the footprint course that Axia provides is a free section about breakouts. Okay? We talk about a signaling in breakouts where we have a shift particularly uh, in execution and liquidity. Okay? So what you tend to see just before a breakout, it's almost like the peaceful calm before the storm and you can see the, the build up in pressure. There's almost like there's nothing going on and it just starts to build and build and crescendo. It, it, the best breakouts always start with that crescendo, the signaling. Okay? But now what very often happens is sometimes the market just goes straight through. Now traditionally breakouts, people will say, just put your stop limit there and when it closes below the candle, you just run it down and become a millionaire like that. But what very often happens on breakouts is sometimes it just keeps going. It doesn't give you any form of an access. But a very, very good footprint access, and I'll show you this in examples later, is when we have that break, so it just breaks the level, so we always talk about early, early interaction, which is the signaling from the market. We do, with a breakout strategy, do have early signals we can execute on. But if we don't get the early signal, do we have access? Anyone? Okay. So, the crux of it. How many of you would just sell on that level? Let's be honest, how many of you would just sell on that level because you think it's a good breakout? Anyone? Okay. Okay, so some people will just sell on that level. Fair enough. Okay, I can understand that. So do the algorithms. They do that as well. Okay, different strategy approach they've got. The point I'm trying to drive home is that if the market gives you access, in other words, let's say it signals to you the relative shift, and we'll talk about this. So just before the break, we start to see the build up in flow, in volume. We start to see the sellers dropping and, and absorbing lower and lower prices. They'd really desperately trying to get filled before the break. We call that a signaling and a breakout. If we get that signaling, we've got access. 
Why? Because we know that when that access point is provided, we've got a high probability of a breakout. If they don't provide us that access, do we have a trade? No, we don't. We're guessing. Come on, let's call it what it is. Just because there's a level there that we think might break out doesn't mean we have a trade. We're just assuming it'll break. Now, the approach you take, nothing wrong with it, by the way. Absolutely nothing wrong. I'm not trying to downplay it. But I want to kind of give you a different scenario. Let's say I said to you that if you found that with access points, it starts to work seven, eight out of times out of ten, you're going to start to build confidence. You're going to be like, oh, wow, there's that access point again. I'm going to hit that. What do you think you're going to start doing with your size? You're going to increase it or decrease it? Of course you're going to increase it. Okay, and that's why we use the access points. The access points gives us the confidence. Confidence means we can leverage. Okay, confidence doesn't mean we're guessing. Conf we're just confident in the process we're taking, which is when we get that access, we can execute. The more we do the same thing over and over, the more confident we become, the more size we use. Now that's an early access point. Now with breakouts, it's quite nice because you tend to get two access points. And by the way, I will always talk about these things as though they, they're easy. They're not. Okay, make no mistake, breakouts happen in high speed. If you're not prepared for it, if you're not 100% focused on it, if you trade across eight markets, sometimes you miss this. Okay, I would like to think two or three trades a day I miss as a result of not being focused on one opportunity. The important thing is you only have to latch on to one opportunity to make good money. Okay, the second access point. And this is lovely. Once we've broken, what very, very often happens is that you get that moment of absorption. It's almost like the break comes and on that break you get one last person providing liquidity. So you get one last buyer just standing in the way there who provides a temporary <coughs> liquidity. Now, I'm going to give you a basic understanding of why I think this happens. Okay? You've got algorithms that are plugged in that are there to fade volatility. In other words, a market snaps, five handles suddenly, spoos. Right? The current volatility only calls for two handles. Suddenly we've done five. What do the algorithms do? The volatility algorithms. They're going to fade. Okay? They're going to fade it just for small incremental bounds. Why? Because the model says they fade. So what very often happens is you suddenly get on the break, you get a little bit of liquidity being provided. Right? But note, the liquidity is being provided by the buyers, but at the same time, what are the sellers doing? Reloading. They're reloading it. They're selling it. Okay, so what's happening is you're going to get something like this. You're going to get, if this was a footprint, you're going to get 1,000 by 1,000, and you're going to get maybe 2,000, and maybe 2,000, something like that. Okay, so what ends up happening is you've got this hive of activity. Buyers are lifting offers, but the offer keeps reloading. Equally, the sellers are selling into that bid, and you get this hive of liquidity being provided, just on the break and it happens so quickly that's the hard part I'm talking 10 seconds guys 10 15 seconds maybe and as soon as that buying stops what does the market do Gabam. two access points so I come back to that same question I asked you in the beginning do we have a trade if there's an access point okay some people might um, might disagree but those very same people don't understand that the concept of what we're trying to do as traders, we're not trying to be small. We want to use leverage. We use leverage when it's in our favor, when we get those access points. Now, what I'm going to say to you is, it's not that simple. You just go look at breakouts and look for these access points. Okay? You are definitely going to see those access points. When you start using the footprint, you're going to begin to recognize those accesses more often than not. But they evolve. Okay, like I said to you, sometimes the market just breaks and goes. There was one in Euro dollar, actually. It was, a, it was a positioning unwind, and I was looking for my access point, and the next thing I had to end up just selling it there. Okay, so what do I do to adjust? Well, I'm not going to miss out on the sell-off just because I haven't been given the access point. But I'm not necessarily going to do the same size as I'm going to do there. Why? Because the risk parameters are different. So I still want to partake. I still think it's a good sell. I've still got some form of understanding that price will go lower. But I've got no conviction in it. So to answer your question, 100% sell the line, of course. Okay? You could probably sell that line nine times out of ten and take a tick. 
and be successful. It's a good strategy. But what are we after? We're after the access points so that we can do it with conviction and size. That's, that's the crux of it, guys. How quickly would you pyramid on top of that if you were obviously right? So again, what we, what we tend to teach, and it comes back to that information spectrum. At the top here, yeah, we've got less information than we have at the bottom here. Yeah. Okay, so for me, that's an early trade with slightly smaller size. That's a second trade with less information with slightly more size. Why? Because I've got more information there. Okay. Beyond that, do I want to be selling it down there? Probably not. By the way, with regards to this, where's our stop? Where's the stop go? If we're early access, we're preemptive. Where does our stop go? Above the access. Okay. So if we pyramid hit the second one, where does our stop go? The second access. Above the second access. Same place. Okay. Again, no right and wrong, guys. No right and wrong. Why, why not above the second access? No right and wrong. Okay. For me, you don't want to go by the second access because there's a little bit of volatility coming in, yeah, that yeah. you might just get flicked out and then it goes. Uh, on, your added, on your added size, mm -hmm. what you don't want to do is going back to the first point still with the same added size. Why right? not? If, if you start to see it goes above the, mm -hmm. the, the access point, then you want to unload. Okay. The, no? I, I don't know, I'm asking. No, no. It's a fair question. Okay. Remember, by hitting early, we get basically first price advantage. Right? Once we hit that second, we're going to drag our price somewhere down to more or less with that trigger. Okay, we call that a trigger line to that trigger line. Now, what's the objective on a leverage trade where we have an access point? Is to leverage to take advantage of the strategy. Am I concerned if I lose five ticks on a high probability strategy? So why would I risk, and this is the thing, stop management is crucially important. You don't stop where it feels comfortable, where you can save a tick. You stop out where a trade is invalidated. Okay? We give ourselves that protection. It's not to say you could put your stop there and you could be fine. Okay? But for me, given the nature that is going to be volatility, imagine, imagine the market goes bit up and it ticks a one lot on two and stops you out. And then pukes. You're just going to be infuriated with yourself. Okay. The crux of why I wanted to get a, get around to that is not about where the stop goes. Okay. That's that's not important. Today is is not about numbers, guys. It's not about where I put the stop. Remember, today is about you are learning your own approach using the footprint. Okay. For some, they might want to put the stop there. Some there. It's completely up to you. I'm not going to tell you what's right and wrong. But what I am going to say to you is, can you start to understand the power of not just access points? but risk management using the footprint. The footprint tells us where that access point is. It also tells us where it's invalidated and where we're wrong. Okay. When you know where you're wrong and you, you know those access points, suddenly the game starts to seem simple. Okay. At any point have you heard me say, well, if Donald Trump comes out, equities might go down, or if this candlestick does this. No. Everything I've told you today is not based on anything other than a fact. Liquidity comes in. We can see it there. We simply execute on it. Everything is a fact-based approach. It's not opinionated. It's not my opinion. It's a fact-based approach. More powerful than any subjective approach you've ever heard anywhere else. Can I just challenge you? Though? Of course you can, please. <laughs> um, you said with some confidence, and, I, and maybe we're just yep. hypothesizing, break, pause, and accelerate. Mm -hmm. And the pause is actually algos fighting the break mm -hmm. because of a range-based algorithm. Yep. Is that a fact or your opinion? My opinion. Okay. One hundred percent my opinion. Okay. okay. Just like when there's stops triggered in the market. Yeah. Okay. For me, the stops are triggered by volatility algorithms. Um, more importantly, it's the very algorithms that are short taking profit on that blip on the range blip. My opinion. Okay. Through observation. Uh, me too. Through I observation. And I have an opinion. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Remember. You've got to live and die by your opinion. Yeah. Um, so long as you've got a structured approach to that opinion. Okay? This is my structured approach. My opinion is if liquidity comes in the low just before a breakout, I'm selling it there. Okay? Over time, through seeing it enough times, I enhance that opinion. But I'm always basing that opinion not on, I think it's going to go down. I'm basing it on something which is always observable. Liquidity at a low just before a break is always observable if you have a footprint. Always. Might not always be there, 
But that fact can always be observed. Well, you're, you're mixing opinion with story about why it happens. Mm -hmm. And one thing you can measure is probabilities. Okay. That's a fact, yeah. And the story about why it happens could just remain that, a story. Exactly. Do you agree with that? Yeah. 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 Okay. This could just as easily go up. Yeah. But my approach, is your approach. Yeah. right or wrong, yeah. it's probability. I'm stopped there. What have I lost? Yes. You're aggrieved on that. Okay. Yeah. If I go at the end of the day, I observe this as another example. Yeah. You know, and some people might say, yeah, okay, but then sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Well, guess what? When it works, I'm going to make what I make, and when I lose, I'm not going to lose a great deal. Does that sound like a strategy that you can put the odds in your favor? Of course it is. Yeah. Are you good at holding all your winners? It depends. <laughs> it depends. Look, what I will say to you, it's probably the wrong question to ask me. Um, you know, I've always said, the difficult thing about the job we do is, I, when I was growing up as a trader, to answer your question, okay, I was always of the firm belief that you judge a trader by his understanding and interpretation of something. Okay? And I used to look at traders that could make a million pound a year and I'd be like, well, he doesn't even know what interest rates are. He doesn't take one tick winners with a thousand. I mean, that's not, that's not a real trader. Well, hang on a sec. What, what's, what's, what's the end point of our game? In chess, it's checkmate. No matter how you got to chess, mate. No, no one asked how you got to checkmate if you did in three moves or 30 moves. At the end of the day, it's all about who puts the biggest P&L on their, their account. So, for me as a trader, I spent the first three years, four years of my career being that guy who wanted to be right. You so desperately wanted to know why it went up and, and you know, yesterday it trended, I'm going to be a buyer today and I want to hold it all day and I want to I wanna tell everyone I made 30 ticks and 40 pips and I want to I wanna be that guy. You know, I, I want to rub that ego of mine, you know, because it's nice. Everyone likes the ego rubbed. We'd we'll all be lying if we said we didn't. But then the mindset changed. The mindset went from stop, stop wanting to be right per se yes. and start being right at the right time. Okay, and that's what it comes down to. This job is not, and again, I'm, I'm going to drive this point home. You don't have to know everything in this job. What you do have to know is how can I make good money consistently time and time again. If you adopt that mindset, you're going about it in the right way. If you go home today and you go back to the old way of thinking, well, I'm going to go for those 40 tick winners and play this way, then you're just adopting bad habits. That's all bad principles. Okay, so take it from where it comes. I learned the lesson the hard way. I was lucky enough to survive, make no mistake. In 2015, that could have been the end of my career. Okay? Sorry? I, I got bailed out. I was like, you know, too big to fail. So I got bailed out, um, fortunately. Um, too big to be failed because I was a nice guy and someone gave me a, a loan and a hand. So the point I'm trying to make, though, is that the moment I adopted that different understanding, my career suddenly started to change. Okay? Now, it's not to say that I've, I've experienced some of the things that I know other traders experienced, okay? There's a lot in my understanding and interpretation that needs a lot more work on. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I've got the right process and that's what I'm here to teach you guys. I'm not here to give you the holy grail because I don't know what it is. Right? But what, I am, what I'm certain of is that you've got to have a structured approach. I'm 1000% certain on that. And I know if you guys can adopt that approach, which is what I'm trying to teach you today, you will be far better off. You will actually start to gain consistency, confidence, making money and all that kind of wonderful stuff. Okay, anyways, let's not get sidetracked. Let's get to the fun. Um, what are we? Hop us one. Is everyone still okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. It is quite warm. Um, if anyone knows how that heater works, I don't know how to turn it down. If someone can just, just drop it three degrees or two degrees, please. Okay, so here's that example. Let's just go through this on the footprint so we can see it. So here's our example of, of absorption consolidation. And I've, I've explained this to you quite well. We're looking for the passive aggressive, the delta versus price change, the delta exchange. And what we can see, every time we come to these lows, we get these dark colors. Okay, that's the liquidity being provided. Okay, every time we come to the highs, notice the liquidity, the darker colors. And this is in essence what's happening. Notice the dark colors at the bottom. So market is absorbing. Okay, the, the sellers keep trying. We can see they're selling with a negative delta, but we can also see the volume picks up, which is telling us all that effort is being absorbed. Absorbed. That's what absorption is. It's absorbing the effort. Okay? It's not to say that they won't eventually overwhelm the buyers, but right now, 
it's not going to happen. Okay, and likewise, we can see to the upside. So the buyers come and they start to put pressure on those sellers. They just can't get through eventually, they back off. Notice the price. Okay, this is the real key, absorption. You can see the effort being put in, but the price is not quite responding. That's the real clue, price and volume. Okay, let's get to our next concept. Again, I'm not going to go through this, candlestick examples. Bad high, bad low. You would have heard this, you would have seen it on Twitter. Okay, but a bad high, bad low is very simple. And again, this is where the footprint is just, it's so much, it gives you so much more information than traditional candlesticks. So sometimes we look at a daily candle like that. Okay. Bullish, bearish. Relatively bullish, relatively bearish. I would, uh, yeah, I would, I, again, <laughs> nothing is fine. There's, as long as you don't say bearish, that's fine. As long as no one says that this is bearish, okay? What I'm trying to get at the crux, don't worry about what it means. The important thing is that when we look just at a candlestick like that, we cannot interpret what's going on at that low. Okay, sometimes you have a well-auctioned low, so you'll sometimes see me tweet say, it was a well-auctioned low. We're going to talk about well-auctioned lows when we talk about strategy, i.e. the V-reversals. It could be a poorly auctioned low, which is what we're going to talk about now. Bad high, bad low. Okay? So a poorly auctioned low is nothing other than a low where we have a significant amount of liquidity provided. Why do we call this a bad low, bad high? It's very simple. The basic premise of market auctioning is to facilitate trade between buyers and sellers. So if a market comes down to this point, where there should be buyers and we see a lot of liquidity being provided okay in order for there to be a lot of liquidity provided we have to have a buyer providing that liquidity but at the same time what do we have we have someone that's selling it there okay and that goes against that principle of auctions okay because an auction at a discount right we shouldn't be seeing a seller being aggressive and showing, selling so much volume and, and, you know, effectively trying to provide and take all the liquidity they can. We shouldn't see that. So when we go against the principle, and you'll see it a lot, if you've ever done the market profiling course, um, you'll hear the word anomaly. And anomaly is anything that goes against the principle. Now, one of, them, one of the anomalies most of you all know is divergences. Okay? Divergence is an anomaly. The only problem is that people don't always define what an anomaly is. They just say it's an anomaly, but they actually don't know why they're saying it. Anyways, so when you have an anomaly, something that goes against the underlying truth, the principle, all right, ultimately that needs to resolve itself. Now here's the caveat. Okay? You would have heard of ledgers. Who's heard of ledgers? Okay, ledgers on a profile. Something that, surprise, surprise, a lot of traders make good money out of. Okay? No secret there. Ledgers tend to resolve themselves. Why? It's not because we have the holy grail and we know that they resolve themselves. It's because you've seen enough ledgers and seen the response at those ledgers enough times to know that you can make money out of it. The problem... But should you be selling a ledger if it goes up to... No. Okay, so a ledger is effectively this. It's where there is a great hive of activity taking place and the market starts to build a number of tests on a certain area. So. Imagine this is five minute candles and we test one, two, three, four, five times. The market just cannot get past there. We call that a ledge. Now these ledges resolve themselves. The problem, sorry, that says ledge. The problem is that a bad trader assumes. A bad trader goes, well, I'm just going to go short. Now what sometimes happens with ledges is the market goes that way. Why? Because there's lots of bad traders that are selling into that, waiting for it to break. Equally, What's happened before we've created that ledge? Once, we've had sellers engage, get aggressive, try and sell. Twice, we've had sellers engage, try and sell. Three times, four times, five times. What is that telling us about the positioning in the market? One, two, three, four, five times we've got short trying to sell the market, which means there's a net short in the market. And that's why sometimes ledges can be extremely painstaking in reversing. Why? Because everyone is on the wrong side. Now, typically speaking, ledges, are created, again, my opinion, okay, they are created by shorter time frame players, algorithms, day traders, whatever you want to call it, by them effectively selling, trying to facilitate that trade lower, but a big time frame player sitting on the other side just trying to get an order filled. Okay, in other words, one side is speculating on price direction, the other side is just filling out an order. Okay? 
And obviously when that market goes back bid, because Mr. Big Boy here needs to fill the order, prices start to rise and the short term players take it up quite aggressively. So like I said to you, everything in this job, every time we execute, every time we trade, a bad trader goes home and he says, I was unlucky. The algorithms, they made the ledge not break. I lost money because of the algorithms. Okay, and I can promise you a lot of traders lose a lot of money on these ledge breaks, right? because they assume it'll break. So rather than the assumption, what do we wait for? That fancy six letter word, access. So we come in the next day, Remember I told you about colorful lines that we use for anomalies? We put a green line there. We're aware of it. We're not going to assume it's going to break. It could last a couple of days, but we're aware of it. Now what we need is we need that access point. We need the market to tell us when we are entitled to attack that low. And that access point comes in the form of what? What did we see the day before? We saw lots of selling, but lots of buying. So what do you think is going to create the perfect access point now? Okay, so yes, an increase in volume. What about, what about? Less buying. Okay, simple answer is just less buying. That's all we want to see. We just don't want to see anyone buying it, yeah. And that we can access via the footprint. The moment we start to approach this, we see the sellers start to engage, we see the volume pick up, and we don't see the buyers responding. We hit, we're in. Potentially, yes. Okay. Potentially. By imbalances, sorry, I will go through imbalances later. We just simply mean almost a low volume area. So this gets attacked so hard that everyone just piles in and you kind of almost get like a stock-like type price action and the market quickly auctions lower. Again, simple concept called a bad high, bad low. Principle. We know what it is. We give it a label. We know what it should do. This is the fantastic part. Most of you are very decent at determining which way price should go. But unfortunately, a lot of us, including myself, are not always as good as taking advantage of that understanding of which way price should go. When we start to determine the way we can access that opportunity, then we can start to become better at it. Okay, so as an example. Wait, 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 wait. Many yes. A lot of people would have stops under that level. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hence yeah. the imbalances. Yeah. Okay. So this is an example of a bad low. Okay, what you can see here. 782 by zero. Followed by an 889 by zero. Now this is the E-Money 500s again. And what we can see here is someone keeps coming down to this price point and selling a lot of size. How do we know it's a lot of size? Simple as that. It's dark color relative to everything else. Okay. More importantly, we come a third time. And what happens this time? Not only do we see a dark amount of selling, but we also see... Come on. Lower price. It's a tick lower. Okay. So we've gone a tick lower and we've absorbed 1700. What else has happened? Look at the price point above it. What's happened over here? No. Okay. So what has the buyer done? Okay. Spot on. So the market comes down. The seller sells. I'm going to annotate it. 1637. Yeah. The seller hits again at 1705. Now I'm not sure in which order this happens, but you'll understand in a second. In other words, the seller sells 1600, sells 1700, relatively large. Price doesn't move. And the buyer goes, thank you, I'll buy now. I'll buy another 1,200 a market. So what you're saying is that he was passive, but buying passive. Uh -huh. Okay, so first instances, we have a passive buyer. An elephant, okay, we call this an elephant, or an iceberg, or there's a number of names for it, but this is an iceberg order in the market. It's someone that's just reloading a price. When he's filled, the market will move. Until he's filled, the market ain't going to move. So... Once, twice, this time the buyer goes even aggressively. He's got so much size to do, he takes three and a half thousand and then lifts another thousand two hundred. And price rises again. What happens the next time? What happens the next time we come here? Notice the color shading. If you add up that volume and that volume and that volume and you compare it to that volume and then most importantly that volume. Do you guys see the shift? 
More importantly, what do we notice here? Seven. Okay. So the buyer, again, not trapped. Okay. Remember, an elephant's not necessary. Never ever look at a market as though it's speculative in direction. Okay. That buyer is simply just an order that wants a lot of size. Okay. We observe it as that. We don't care why he's buying, but we observe it that he is buying. Okay. One last order of 1700 gets lifted. The sellers are now, what are they doing? Every time we came down, the sellers weren't reloading the offer. There was no reload of an offer. Yeah, no reload of an offer. No reload of an offer. Suddenly, the sellers are now pissed off. Okay. We've had enough of this rubbish. We're going to reload that offer. We need this volume done now. We're going to reload that offer. And that's your telltale sign. Suddenly, the sellers turn from backing off every time at this level to now holding price, holding the price pressure. Okay. Notice the volumes though, not significant by any means. Right? All of a sudden, the next rotation, the volume shifts, the delta shifts, and the ledge collapses. Uh, is the reason why, um, and obviously that's reflected with the light pink color, but mm -hmm. is the reason why uh, up until that point we have uh, 200, 100, we have hundreds on, on, on both bid and ask, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden we have less than 100. So at, at, at what point, um, what I'm trying to say is, uh, uh, it, is it reflection that this went very, very fast, mm -hmm. and therefore the, the buyers didn't have time to yeah. jump in? Spot on. Spot on. In other words, what's happened here is that once the market now finally got a whiff, Okay, and remember when I say the market, we mean the algorithms, okay? So a lot of this is created by the algorithms. They've obviously sensed, or the sellers now come in and they need to get going on price, okay? But now there's no more liquidity. That's all this is showing. It's just showing suddenly, now, so for the last 45 minutes, there's been plenty of liquidity. Now the liquidity's gone, it's finished. Okay. So there's two things we take from this. We go put a red line here, why? Because there was a massive buyer there. We don't forget that. We don't forget that there was a very unique buyer there. It's important. At some point, the market will come back and test this point and provide us with a significant sell opportunity. Why? Because this is support. Someone's supporting the market, providing liquidity. At some point, we came back and tested this and offered. Easiest scalp in the world. Okay? But yes, more importantly, the light colors show us that change in the nature of the market, the dynamic of the market. Right? Now notice, notice how it thins out, it lightens out just before the actual break. And that's kind of our signaling clue. Now again, I'm not going to say this is easy. Okay? What I am going to say is that the observations, are there, the signaling is there for us to enter shorts. The zeros is our confirmation. In other words, we need to be in before the zeros because the zeros is a low volume area or an imbalance. In other words, the selling is so aggressive, the buyers can't even lift a single one lot. The market starts to offer. We get our first little bit of liquidity, okay, which we enter in potentially for more. And we look to just play with the flow, go with the flow. Everyone happy with that? So in real time, when you're looking at this, so up until that point, it would be moving like this, mm -hmm. like this, and then all of a sudden it would go boom. That, that's what the light... Like yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, there's an important question you've raised there with the, the vroom. <laughs> okay, because the vroom, one person will say, well, on the price ladder, it just skipped. But someone might say, well, yeah, everything looked kind of thick on the, the bids. It didn't look that empty, the bids. And that's where the footprint is more powerful than, for me, any other tool, because the footprint doesn't go vroom. The footprint tells you, well, look at the difference in liquidity. It's very, it's a markable difference. So I can use the footprint to confirm the vroom. And suddenly I can start to say, well, when I see the vroom on the price ladder, maybe that's the signal on the vroom when I have a ledge. Maybe that's what I'm looking for, that vroom. And I confirm it on my footprint. Hence why we marry the tools. We don't, we don't want to just have a pro, we want to marry our tools. But most important, we marry them in the right way. We don't just use something for the sake of it, we use it to add value. Okay, that's bad high low. Any questions? Apologies to No, the, no, no, never apologize. Uh, uh, you're using that, that 
specific moment you're using an evolving candle. It's not finished yet. Okay, yes. Yeah, that's true. Isn't yes. It? Yeah, okay. Go further with that, though. There's an important thing you're going to say there, which is important. You have mentioned I wait for closes on uh -huh. the strategy. Okay. Here you're using a, a, an evolution as it went through the... Spot on. So now, to answer your question, okay, let's go back to our information curve. If I wait for confirmation of that, okay, remember this is opportunity, uh, other way around. This is information, this is opportunity. Now based on that trade strategy, right, if I wait for that candle to close, where are we on the information spectrum? You would have lots of information after the close, but less opportunity. Okay. Yeah. So there are certain instances yeah. in which, and I, I did a a YouTube video on this a while ago actually, it was all about there is a time and a place to be preemptive. In, in other words, when you are not preemptive sometimes you're actually taking on more risk. In this instance, you take more risk on waiting for that five minute close than you do being preemptive. Okay? But you still have to be preemptive with access. We don't preempt just, sorry, we don't preempt just for the sake of preempting because we think it's going to go because that kind of approach is going to do you no good. We preemptive when the market says you've got a signaling now. Now preempt. Now take the risk. Until then, you don't have access. And yes. You get your confirmation from the close of the previous candles. Potentially. Okay, access can come in. Hundred percent. Okay, so remember, I'm just showing you access points based on that day. Okay, bad lows and highs, they will all exist. That's a concept. We know that concept. But how you access that will change. Sometimes you don't get to access it. Hardest thing in the world, and that's where true discipline comes in. Discipline isn't sitting at your desk or not eating the cakes on the table. That's not discipline. Discipline is knowing that something is going to occur, but still not doing it because you don't have the right approach to it. That is true discipline. Okay? Now I can tell you hands down, I'm not a very well disciplined trader. Okay? Sometimes I'm not a very patient trader, but that I can work on. Now that discipline I can work on. Seeing enough of these, I can go back and say, why did you hit this year? Okay, equally, remember, the only reason I get away with it, and this is where honest self-reflection is so important, the only reason I get away with it is ledgers, I lose money on the bad discipline, but I make the money back. Why? Because of the persistence. So I'll probably lose the first three times because I'm ill-disciplined, but I'll make some because of the persistence. What's the net result? I can choose. I go home and I say, okay, well, well done, you made money. Or I can say, no, not good enough. You lost three times. Why are you preempting? You see the honesty approach. And that's what trading is, guys. It's about being honest. It's about being willing to be honest. Most okay, of us okay, aren't. I'm losing okay, but breaking your rules, not okay. Okay, yeah. spot on. Yeah. yeah. Okay, everyone happy with that? Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. that previous example, where's the, sort of the tipping point where you're actually comfortable to take the trade? At what point are you actually go? Let's go back. Okay. So for me, I would say that that would, have been, that would have been enough for me to put something on. Okay, I would have liked to have seen it because the first time we've seen the sellers now holding the offer lower down ahead of that break. Okay, so any kind of room on the price ladder would have probably gone in, but because I've got enough price ladder skills. Okay, if I had, and this is the problem, if I was looking at the footprint at that point in time and I suddenly saw that start to occur, Okay, that would have been enough for me. But that's what I'm trying to say. It's not always as straightforward as you just, just hit it. It doesn't work like that. Okay, it's only if it gives you some sort of signaling. What would have been ideal is if somehow this candle closed like this, the next candle opened, yeah, we started to see a lot of liquidity provided, yeah, I would have gone big on that. That I would have hit as hard as I could simply because if a seller is willing to reload as much as they can just before the break, well, damn sure it's going. The probability of that going now is very high. Okay, so in that instance, I would have reacted differently to this instance. Okay, this happened very quickly. I'm not going to make it sound as though you just had loads of time to get short and have a cup of tea and then you were 10 handles on side. Yeah. Um, I don't think this is a good example, but could you talk about like the pickpocket? Yeah. Okay, where, this is the wonderful thing about footprints. Okay, where do we take traditionally now with our strategies, where do we take profit? Most of us, including myself. Let's be honest. Come on, someone be honest with me. Where do we take profits at the moment? Maybe predetermined uh, profile, it's profile um, points that you've predetermined. Okay, so I love that word predetermined. 
because it comes back to the thing we started right in the beginning. If we predetermine, we make the assumption. We know. Aha. So to answer your question, where do we take profit? Okay. Not easy. I, I take profit a lot of the time where it feels comfortable and I can, can make some money. That, that's cool for me. Okay. But the honest answer is we've got to take profit. We've got to learn to be disciplined enough to take profit where the market tells us to take profit. Now, the reason I've always struggled with this is because I've got a playbook of... Uh, if you've known me for long enough and you've watched enough YouTube videos, you'll know I've got a playbook of about 50, 60, 100 different types of approaches you can trade the market. Okay, I've never been focused and disciplined enough to just take one to the extent that I could tell you in scenario A, B, and C, this is the likely outcome, this is the likely of opportunity. The moment I do do that, okay, I don't want to say my consistency because I'm consistent enough, but my success will evolve. Okay, it's an evolution of my own trading. And that's what trading is. It's about acknowledging those weaknesses, and I've got them in here, strange enough. Acknowledging those weaknesses and constantly working on that. Okay, if you can work and master in on one strategy, if you're making money now, imagine how much you'll make when you actually start mastering it. Okay, and this is where we're going to finish the, the session three. Is I'm going to show you what mastery leads to in the end. Okay, I'm not a master and I never want to be called a master. I'm not an elite trader because I haven't had the discipline to go and actually become a master of one thing. Okay, I'm the chef that can make a pretty cool menu. I can make you a burger, a lasagna, I can do all these nice things. But can I do you a Michelin three star meal? So no. why was that, apart from, apart from um, Inuesh, <laughs> that now, the trader, Navinda, yeah. why was he so, at the early days of the few things, why was he so great? I have no clue. That's a simple answer. I don't know who he was. I oh, you weren't there then? No. Oh, no. You were. and oh, yeah. Okay. He, he was great because he probably had a different mindset, he had a different way of doing something. Yeah, okay, yeah. And it's usually, it's usually how it is. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about mindset when we get later on. But um, yeah, let's get to it, guys. Cause Sorry, could I just go Yeah, of course. Yeah, sure, sure. On that um, access point mm -hmm. that we're showing there, that was actually a responsive up file. How mm -hmm. far up did it go? Would you, have entered, would you have actually entered on that, or would you have entered on the down one? Oh, no, on the way down. Yeah, so, on the right, so, you, so you observed that oh. point yep. of high volume. Yeah. So you respond on the next one. Yeah, part. so what's happened here? Let's, let's, let me break this down. 2 by 89, 0 by 240, and 127 by 172. Stops, isn't it? Spot on. Okay. So what's happened in essence is there's stops that gone off in the market and the seller is now holding this price pressure. He's holding the price pressure to the downside. Sorry, this has gone back up and sorry, the buyer has stopped it up. In other words, the seller was absorbing, the buyer stopped it back up and then the next rotation, the market opened and dropped off, straight line. Okay, I should have actually included that. Um, I might see if I can get that in the break for you and get the full example. And, uh, sorry, very last question. Mm -hmm. So would you have st start, uh, started unloading your position as soon as you would have seen like uh, the darker red? Uh, ah, that was to answer the question of profit take, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so where's this candle closed? On the low. Okay, so it's closed on the low. We've got a high relative volume and a high relative delta. But in, sorry, in real time, yep. when you start to see, for example, the darker red, mm -hmm. um, where there's a circle um, mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of the... Yeah. Would you, have, would you have started unloading? Okay. So again, the one thing with the footprint and the one thing... It's not easy talking about targets, okay, because... Sometimes it depends on how heavy you are, how much size you have on, um, how you're looking to approach it. But let's say I was in the simplest mindset, of I just want to put a one lot on and I want to see what it can do. Okay, so we remove ourselves from all the emotions, all the risk, all the, am I up or down there? We just say we have a one lot, let's see what it can do, right? We need to give the market enough time to be able to give us that, that information spectrum again. So waiting, say, the first one minute, seeing that liquidity, is that enough time? I don't know. Okay? It might have been a case that it came down here and went straight back up. It might have. I don't know. Okay? And that's what we've got to learn to do. We've got to learn to be able to look at enough of these to decipher, okay, well, when that's coming in, the fact that there's so much selling coming in at this point and price pressures to the downside, surely there should be more of that price pressure to come. Let me give it maybe three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, rather than the usual one minute. If it snapped, 
and all of a sudden we didn't see any selling and the selling just disappeared, by all means then we could say, okay, well this doesn't feel right. Because it's, it's not an easy topic, but looking at the rotations, right, the fact that we closed on the low here, we wouldn't be getting out at this point. Okay, the information is very aggressively leaning towards potential for, maybe not a continuation, but we're going to at least test lower prices. Okay? And it's only when we stop that testing of lower prices, i.e. when buyers start to provide sufficient liquidity to stop the market, that we then consider getting out. Easier said than done. Okay, easier said than done. I don't want to make it sound as though it's as straightforward as I'll just sit back and look at the five minute chart. Um, okay, let's get on to market positioning. Is everyone still okay in terms of hunger? We're at two o'clock. Um, okay. Market positioning, I'm, I'm going to suggest we go for another, how long are we, are we good on the battery? 68 minutes. Still to go. Yeah. Okay, so let's go another 20 minutes, everyone's good with that, and then we can do lunch. Cool. Okay, market positioning. Big fallacy. Most people think you can interpret using the delta the market positioning. Okay, that's wrong. It's, it's, it's the biggest balls i I've ever heard. And a lot of traders do spell that out. You'll see them tweet, there is a negative 4,000 delta, therefore the market's position short. Now why I argue against that is because let's say we have minus 4,000 but price is up plus 20 on the day. How can we assume that the minus 4,000 is positioning? Okay, we can't. Positioning is the market takes a position somewhere. All right? We get initiative taken at that point in time and the positions are defended. Okay. Whilst there's positioning, we need to see advancement. Okay. If there's a position in the market, we need to see price pressure continuing in that direction. Okay. So don't forget, it comes back to that concept, the footprint is everyone's interaction, all buyers and sellers. To assume that that delta implies positioning means you're assuming everyone is speculative in nature. In other words, everyone has an outright position, long or short. Now, a fact is that most bond markets, about 78% of all bond traded flow is spread. Yeah. Twos versus tens. So if I'm selling the twos and I'm buying the tens and there's a positive delta, does that mean the market's position is long? No. It means there's a spread in the market. So don't fall prey to that. I'll show you how you interpret positioning. It's very simple. Okay. We spoke about that concept initiative. Initiative's taken. We see a big time frame player initiating initiating, initiating, okay? And at that price point where we see initiative taken, we want to see a few things. One, we need to see price respond, okay? So price is our first key element, price response. And two, we want to see delta respond. And three, we need to see volume respond. If you get the combination of all three of those, a price response with a delta response and on relatively high volume and price moves up, you can assume there is positioning in the market. Okay, why? This, got, this has got a lot to do with the principles again. In order for price to go up on high volume and have a high positive delta, what do the buyers have to do? They have to lift relatively large offers. Okay? And that's why we throw in that concept of relatively high volume, not low volume, because if there's low volume and buyers come to the market to start lifting small offers, it's not telling us a great deal about the net effort taken. Okay? Everything when it comes to positioning has got to do with that net effort. How much effort is being taken by the buyers in this example? The more effort it takes them to get that price up, the stronger the price positioning and vice versa. And that's why we brought that concept in the beginning of effort and what effort is uh, in effect. Okay, so what we're looking at is very simple. Back to that wonderful concept of lines. Sometimes you see on my Twitter chart, you'll see a yellow line. So yellow lines are just simply showing me where the positioning was taken from. Again, can you understand the power of those colorful lines? Okay. I don't have to think, oh, price point 30, that's where the oil market was bid up this morning, that's where the initiative came in. I know it's initiative, why? Because there's a strong price response, a high delta and a high volume. Therefore, if we get back below that yellow line, right, we've got the potential for opportunity. Right? It all depends on the position, it depends what have the buyers done since that point. Everyone happy with that? Okay, let's look at an example. 
And again, I like to relate it on a candlestick chart so you can get an idea of what it looks like on a candlestick chart. So in essence, we start off with neutral. Markets always start off neutrally priced and we start to see price move lower. Okay, a little bit of consolidation. How do we know? Well, we can see no real change, low volume. Note the story being told. Not absorption, not is it absorbed, low volume. Price not moving, lots of wicks, unchanged price. Consolidation. Market then aggressively turns low. We see the volume pick up. Okay, so we can see the initiative taken at this price point. We see someone stepping in. Now, if you went and looked at this on a footprint, and I think we are going to look at this on a footprint in the next slide, you're going to see that initiative step into the market, the positioning created. All right, so there's a bit of effort taken there. We then annotate with a small s, i.e. there's a net short in the market. Not shorts and it's bearish, there's a net short now. There's a positioning in the market. Market begins to do what? Flag. Okay, flag or consolidate. So we see a little bit of consolidation. And then we actually start to see something interesting, which is a little bit of absorption. Okay, so we move from a consolidatory phase to an absorption phase. Okay, eventually, what do we say? When markets are in absorption, we look for the resolution to resolve itself. And that's what we get here. Okay, at the same time, obviously, we take out that short positioning. We can see that. What do we call this line? How did you recognize the absorption? Okay, through the higher volume. So the higher relative volume. Okay, still within the same. accumulation? Okay, so that's accumulation. Yeah. Now, what do we call this line? Axis. Not quite an axis point. Or starts with a T and ends with the eager trigger. Okay. Why do we call it a trigger line? Because it triggers, it elicits a response from the market. Okay, so we get a trigger. We don't know why. Okay, we just call it a trigger because the market tells us what? There were a lot of people that responded there. Okay. So it breaks down below that net short line. Might have been that, we don't know. Okay, but we look at it. Okay, this is how you can start to annotate your charts. You look at the interesting points of the chart. You go and observe it. You ask the right questions. It spits out some answers. Anyways, market then goes to a neutral positioning. Why? Because now we've taken out the shorts and the market starts to move sideways again. Note, relatively high volume. Okay, high volume, we've got some form of absorption taking place. Market continues. Right, we start to see a second round of initiative taken now. The market starts to turn net long. What do we see call this? Some consolidation taking place. We consolidate and the long continues. The positioning continues to build. Now that's just looking at a candlestick. Notice what I've done there. I've taken first principles, the truths. I've told you the positioning should be getting longer here. So what do I do now? Do you take that as, as, as the truth or do you go and observe the footprint? We observe the footprint and we want to go and look now. What's happening inside this absorption? What's happening inside the consolidation? What's happening as this long position is building? Is there a long position building? Is the delta gaining as we're moving up higher? That's how we start to learn. We ask the market the right questions and we start to develop the story. Okay. Hey Brent, yeah. Uh, right before Wrong. Yeah. Um, that second big circle yeah. where there's a big uh, big candlestick green and then right back down. That's okay. what I was referring earlier on uh, on on, uh, on footprint. You're talking about these ones? No, no, uh, the one on the right. The next one. Yeah, next ah. one. Yeah. And then so you've got volume, I presume you probably also have a, a strong delta in there. Mm -hmm. And then the next one same even bigger volume you go straight back down mm -hmm. then consolidate then go back again mm -hmm. so from the first green candle you would assume there's control from the buyers okay because of the volume and the delta mm -hmm. and, and everything how can the buyers allow the price to go straight back down like this all the way from uh, where the move started mm -hmm. and and then consolidate and then move again what, okay. what's the what's that how do you explain that the best way to explain it yeah. is to ask the market that question. Don't ask me. I don't know why the buyers took it, but they, I agree with you. Yeah, there was, there was definitely someone that stepped in to buy it. And then it just stopped. Wouldn't you call that a short squeeze overall? Though? You've got a bear flag there that's basically gone the other way, so there's a lot of people short on that bear flag. So this is now going in a short squeeze. And it's running a lot of stops. If, if you look at enough of those, and you can interpret on the footprint that the interaction is such that the buyers run the shorts out 
and then all of a sudden it goes off and there's not a single buyer providing liquidity and you call that a short squeeze, then I would say spot on mm. and keep applying that same interpretation. Yeah. Okay, the simple answer is I don't know why they just took a straight offer. I, well, I can tell you why. There was obviously no bid when the market went off it. Okay, yeah, we can call it a short, we can call yeah, it whatever we, we want. Do we? Wasn't that a short dip move on Wednesday's um, Uh That's the S&P. That's not the S&P, that's the oil, sorry. That is, that is the, um, that's yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah. So yesterday. in the morning, it's always a Thursday, Wednesday. And it's either Wednesday or Thursday. That's probably the same Wednesday. Yeah. Anyways, let, let's not get, I think the important point to drive home, okay, is that we don't have enough information here to determine why it's gone back down. Okay. And that's why we want to drill open. We want to, you want to go and observe when that happens. Because what I'm guessing has happened to you is you've probably bought there, which is fair enough. If you've got the access, you've bought there. Right? So now when you lose, don't lose the lesson. And the lesson is, let me go and understand what happened there. Let me look at that footprint. Let me see that interaction. And when it turned, let me see what happened. Let me see what most likely happened is you've probably got some form of an imbalance on the reversal because it happened pretty quickly. In other words, it went, as quickly as it went up, it went down. Okay, um, now this is the market positioning we're talking about. Okay, and there's a little bit of an initiative leg. We can see it's initiative with the volume picking up, with the delta picking up. Okay, we can see the rotations. In other words, price, effort. Okay, the sellers are being rewarded with price here. And we see the continuation pattern. Okay, this is yesterday. So in essence, we can see that positioning coming into the market. Now, this is something I actually want to highlight and talk about. In terms of the auction process, we spoke very clearly about at low prices, we want to see buyers interacting. At high prices, we want to see sellers interacting. So when we get the highest volume of the day as well as the highest delta of the day, a significantly big pickup, and I just want to make this a little more clear. What's occurred in this price reaction? What's happened at this price point? Is this normal to see that aggressive selling after what's occurred before? I'm just panicking here. Um. Well, no. Okay. According to auction market theory. Okay, so auction market theory yeah. dictates we don't sell it there. No. <laughs> we sell it there. So what would make, because this is still selling. Make no mistake, this is still selling. That's why price has gone down, the dial has gone down, and the volume's picked up. So what would make that selling be that aggressive with that a volatility. Stops continuing. Okay. It's that time frame have we got the rotation? Five minutes. Okay. So what's happened in essence here is it is the I give up. Price is pushed to that point where it's the I give up. I'm no longer interested. Okay, we call that a stop run. You should never be seeing in essence the most aggressive delta as well as the highest volume after an extended down move. At the start of a down move, by all means, on a breakout, by all means, but not after an extended down move. When you see that, uh, we call this a pattern, we call it stops. Okay? And when we have stops, we have a very specific strategy of how we can take advantage of that. Oh, you know what? Um, the initial move uh, and then consolidation <coughs> was between the 61.8 retrace, retracement mm -hmm. and 50% of, of the big move the day before. And then when it went down again, it went as low as the 78%. So, yeah, that would have been stops because buyers would have been wanting to re-engage at the 61.8%. And they all got flushed out. Uh, yeah, I mean, too. That's why I know it's so much. And, uh, yeah, so. Cool. That's the, those, yeah, that would back that up, that the stops were lower. Cool. Down to the 20. One thing I will point out, when you do generally get stops, okay, what's very, very typical is a process of, we call it licking our wounds. <laughs> okay, why? It's got a lot to do with the psychology. After a big extended down move, is anyone going to stand in the way and start buying aggressively? No. As it goes bid, what are we going to likely see? Anyone that's still long, just getting out. Okay, equally, when we do get a volatile shift at an extended move, we also get algorithms that will look to take short-term profits. Okay? And that's why what very often happens is when you get a big extended down move, you tend to get a consolidation phase. Now it's important to understand that because a lot of the time, we'll start buying here, and I'll explain to you why it's important, 
we'll start buying it and fading it. Okay. Sorry about that. We'll start buying it and fading it. Is that the right one? Um, yeah. So we'll start buying it and fading it because we expect a little bit of buy price bounce. But the problem is there's going to be a lot of two-way trade. So it brings us back to that discussion about targets. Where's the target if we're going to start fading stops? Okay, fading stops is an extremely valid trade strategy. Okay, trust me, some, some of the nicest winners I get to take is fading stops. But one, you have to know how to do it, and two, you have to know what is the potential for opportunity. When you're fading stops, the potential opportunity is limited. Now, don't get me wrong, this market can go up and reverse, but it's going to take time. Do you take a higher element of risk when there's a longer period of time to wait? Okay, it depends. Right. Okay, that's market positioning. Now, let's move on. And let's get through one or two more concepts before lunch. And let's rub this out. So in short, how does the put printer help to make the market? With the oil? Yeah. Uh, well, definitely, simply that. We've been looking at that, looking for long straight away. Yeah, just simply because of where that market's come from. OK. Um, so this is the reversal of, of the positioning. I'm just going to briefly show you. Note the yellow line, the wonderful yellow line. What do we see after that yellow line? This was particularly interesting. I actually mentioned this on the floor. Okay, but if you pick up on the numbers of this volume, to do 16,500 contracts in five minutes is a substantially large amount of volume on the oil. Okay, so again, we talk about relative shifts. If you know that the average high amount of volume is, say, 5,000 in oil, if suddenly someone comes in and lifts 16,500 and starts to move price like that, what is that telling you? Okay, showing you not just commitment, it's showing you one heck of a commitment. Okay, if you see one heck of a commitment, what's price likely to continue to do? Okay. Because you're not going to just buy 16,000 in five minutes. You're probably going to buy another 16 and 15 and 14,000 after that. You've got a large order to fill. And that's all that's happening. Yeah, that's why we get the price, price rotation higher. Okay, equally note, so we did get an attempt there. Okay, sellers did try their best. Notice the dark colors. Okay. So the sellers were selling into Mr. Big Buyer just taking whatever he could. Sellers stopped, what did we get? Continuation. Notice the, the uh, liquidity again. Okay. Notice the light volume, the buyers got aggressive. What do we see at the top there? Liquidity being provided. Okay. Eventually prices started to back off, lower liquidity being provided, lower liquidity being provided. Okay. And the markets just start to turn sideways. Volumes drop off, orders finished, okay. buying orders done. Okay, cool. Let's see what's next. Support and resistance. I'm going to go through this very briefly. I've probably explained this enough times today. And normally I start with this. Whenever I teach someone about the footprint, I say to him, what is support and resistance? And they all go and they put their hand up and they tell me about the line. That's the oil chart, by the way, next. So they tell me about that line, that magical line called support. And I say to them, well, you know what? Actually, that's the biggest load of rubbish that you've learned in your entire trading career because you've read that in a book. A book that was probably produced in 1980 and that was probably valid in 1980, but unfortunately in this day and age, it's not valid. Okay? Support is where a market participant buys the market. Now, how he buys it is irrelevant, but he buys the market. Okay? Sometimes we might see absorption, in which case we have a bad low. It's still support in the market. Sometimes we have an auction reversal where there's no one responding and the buyer just gets aggressive and buys everything. That's a good support, right? We get different kinds of support and resistance. Right? The important thing is to be able to differentiate between the types of support. And this is where the footprint is extremely useful. Most people look at a daily candle. What they don't do is look at the high and low. If you want a little bit of a case study as, as a nice Christmas experiment, okay, go and get a footprint chart up and go and look at the daily high and low of your market for the last two weeks. And go and take a picture of every single one of them and put them, print them and put it on a carpet next to each other and go and look at the high and low. Just go and look. Just like we did a case study earlier, go and do the same kind of case study now. Observe what the high and low and how they were made. You're going to start to develop an understanding of how highs and lows are made. Sometimes they're made on high volume, sometimes low volume. Sometimes weak support, sometimes strong support. Once you've done that, then you can start to say, okay, what happened the next day? at this price point called support. And you might start to observe, well, when there's a significant support, in other words, the buyers really aggressively buy the market up, 
when it takes that point out, actually there's a very good <laughs> breakout opportunity. You might find when there's a support created by sellers being reluctant, not willing to keep being aggressive, like I showed you in the example, right? you might find those ones go and then reverse. The minute you start to ask the right questions of the market, you're going to start developing an understanding of how the market actually trades. Not based on what I say, but based on how the market participants respond. Okay, my sandwiches look good, don't get distracted. We're almost there. Okay, you shouldn't recognize this, this chart, it pains me to show it to you. This is the oil. Okay, um, this is dating back to pretty much November the 21st. Um, so what is support and resistance? What is a trend line? And, and I'm, I'm kind of going to dispel some of the truths you might think are truths, but they're not. A support is not, this line is not support. Okay, it's not a trend line. It's only there to show me that every time the market gets to lower prices, someone is stopping the market. Now that someone could be a seller reluctantly taking profit. It could be a buyer stepping in. That on its own doesn't give me enough information. So when I gave you a conclusion earlier saying it is reluctant sellers not willing to be aggressive at the lows and reluctant buyers not willing to be aggressive at the highs, that wasn't based on that chart, that's based on looking at the footprints. Okay? I can drill in and see what's occurring every single time in these examples. And that gives me a better understanding. It doesn't mean I'm going to be profitable, but it gives me an advantage as to interpreting what is actually occurring at these lows. So we have got some form of support some form of resistance. Now, this is the important thing. If you go look at the daily volumes, okay, what do we call this phase? We call this either consolidation or absorption. Anyone want to take a guess what the volumes are doing in the soil at the minute? Relatively high, relatively low? Okay, I'll give it away. It's relatively high. So what is this phase called? It's an absorption phase. So what do we know about an absorption phase? What are we looking for in an absorption phase? Okay, a resolution. So we now want to find some form of an access point to that resolution. So what are we looking for? To get to a specific price point. When something changes. When something changes. Okay. When the sellers engage, they step in, they hit the market hard and there's no more buyers to stop it from going down. Or to the upside, when the buyers engage, they initiate to the upside, and the sellers are no longer willing to engage up there. At that point, and only at that point, not when OPEC says, because I thought OPEC would help out with that, not when the Fed Reserve this week hikes rates and goes dovish, not at any of those points, until the buyers and sellers decide. And that's the key takeaway from the entire session today. It's not us or the support or the resistance that decide on price. It's that interaction. It's those buyers and sellers. Why? Because first principles, we know a buyer makes the price go up, a seller makes the price go down. Okay. Give it another one or two concepts. Okay, I'm not going to go through this unless you guys desperately want me to. I think you'll get the crux of it. We've got more to come later. Auction imbalances. Let me just see what I've got left. Okay, auction imbalances. We'll finish here. Very simple. Right, an auction imbalance shows us an imbalance in the auction. <laughs> <laughs> Funny that. Um, okay, so what an auction imbalance is, it's very simply just showing us a shift in the dynamic between the buyer and the seller. Okay, so the way to think of it is almost like a shift in the energy. Now that shift in the energy means nothing in terms of price. Okay, I don't want you to assume that if there's a shift in the energy, it means that price is going to respond. But it is an interaction we want to be aware of. Why? When there's an auction imbalance, it means that suddenly a buyer or a seller has decided to be aggressive for whatever reason they choose. That reason could be stops, it could be they really want the position, there could be news out, there could be economic data. There's a number of reasons why imbalances are created. But the premise behind it is someone has been aggressive. Now, like I said to you in every instance, it's binary. One of two things happens. An auction imbalance fills, or there's continuation. Now, the only reason I know this is because I always thought it was a continuation signal. So I would, whenever I saw an auction imbalance, I'd get short, yeah, and then it would go back up and I'd lose money. I'd be like, oh, that doesn't make sense. 
I must have been wrong. So I'd do it again the next day and I'd go for the continuation. Eventually I got to the point where I said, well, sometimes it continues, sometimes it reverses. Can I ask the market the right kind of questions to determine when it's going to continue, when it's going to reverse? And suddenly you start to learn a few cues. Okay, now, what I would typically say, rule of thumb, when there's high volume coupled with an auction and imbalance, i.e., we can see an auction imbalance here. Okay, we can see relatively high volume as well as some absorption towards the downside. When we see this instance, okay, there's a higher probability for continuation than if it was lower volume. Everyone got that? So auction imbalances to determine between a reversal and continuation, we want to look at the high volume. Okay, let the volume determine whether or not it'll be filled. Okay, now I'm just going to go through these two examples anyways. Liquidity provided, market opens at the top. Okay, light colors, liquidity provided, and suddenly the seller steps it up. Okay, so the seller, once that buyer stepped out of the way, all that happened was the seller went aggressively to market. Okay, we can see the very next candle, what happens? It reverses all the way. Right. The important thing to understand is that there are specific, very, very specific strategies with imbalances as to where they occur. Okay, I'm not going to be going through imbalances today. If you don't adopt the strategy with imbalances, that's fine. But just be aware of what an imbalance implies. It implies a shift in the interaction. Okay, it just shows you there's an aggressive shift in the interaction. It doesn't mean that price will continue lower or higher. You don't have enough information to make that choice. Okay, you have to combine it with other elements, i.e., where is this imbalance occurring? Like I showed you when you had the break out of the ledge, we had an imbalance just before. Right? That gave us a clue that actually we were going to get continuation. Flip that around, we can see in this example, we had an imbalance over here, a light imbalance, and then all of a sudden we had an imbalance on the opposite side. So it's down to us to ask the questions so we can understand what we do when we see these imbalances. Okay, everyone happy with that? Are there any questions with regards to the session? It sounds like um, uh, liquidity being provided is more important than imbalance. Is that a fair statement? I think they're both important, if that makes sense. Um, it's, it's like saying, so when, when, I was, when I first started trading, I used to fade everything. Okay, so in 2011, 12, 13, uh, there was a lot of trends in the market. Markets used to trend quite easily. You don't see trends very often now. But by fading enough trends, you eventually learn what the telltale signs are that there is a trend. Okay, so now, if there's a trend day, I can guarantee you I'm not making much money. I very rarely make money in a trend day. They're so infrequent, but I'm definitely not losing money in a trend day. Okay, because I'm aware of those telltale signs. So, I think a way to look at an auction imbalance is not necessarily to develop a strategy with it, but it's to be aware of what it implies in the market. Okay, Like I said, in terms of the strategy playbook on the footprint course, there is an entire strategy session for imbalances. Okay, Because you can actually, the very simple essence of it, I'll give you a clue, but the very simple essence of it is an imbalance is like a low volume area on profiles. When you've done profiling, you'll understand it's, it's, it's a low volume, it's an untraded area. Now, very often, when the market, maybe it's extended, but come back. But once it re-arrives at that low volume area, you actually tend to see low volume areas become high volume areas. In other words, where there was no liquidity being provided, suddenly you start to see a large amount of liquidity being provided. Okay, Why that occurs, I'm not entirely sure. But it's just something I've observed. Okay. All right, guys, let's, let's wrap it up there. Let's have some lunch. Um, let's give it a half an hour. Um, and we can have some lunch. And then we go again at 3 o'clock. Yeah? Cool.